If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to Romans, Romans chapter 8. And uh, while you're turning over there, we always desire the prayers of the church. It is, uh, I would say, almost an impossibility for a pastor to be effective if his people's not praying for him. Uh, Romans chapter 8, beginning in the first verse. The Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Jesus Christ, who walk after the flesh, but after the, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for an opportunity to meet with your people one more time this side of eternity. God, we pray that each and every one here today will get something from your word that you would send the Holy Spirit by, that you would speak to us, and that you would speak to the people. God, open, and open your word unto us, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise for it, for it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture, and we'll really be pulling our topic out of verse 6, and, is, and it says, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, we live in a day and age where everybody wants peace and things to be in harmony, but few and far between are the individuals that will do what it takes. Now, what I found rather, we are more prone and more given to uh, seeking after torment and after difficulty than we are seeking after peace. And we'll see that by the Word of God. But I want you to see that Paul is writing to the church at Rome. The next chapter, in chapter 9, the way that uh, the King James Bible is divided, he gives us the assurity that he selects his people, and that's why we can depend on it. If we make a choice, the choice may not be good. But if Christ has made the choice, if God the Father has made the choice, that's something you can depend on. So as he is writing to the church at Rome, uh, this is the church that would defect and become the Roman Catholic Church. And you can see in chapter 1, they were always already bending that way. And he gave them a strict warning over images and animals and, and, and uh, not marrying and giving in marriage. He, he was very concerned about this church. So back to verse 1, he says, There is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Now, uh, the first and foremost, are you saved? Are you in the person of Christ? Do you know him? And I'm not asking, do you know about him? Do you know him personally? Do you know Christ? He says, the people who are in Christ. And that is certainly where we ought to desire to be this morning is in the very perfect will of Christ. Now, I hear many preachers read and preach, but they don't finish this sentence. Now, I want you to read with me. It says, there is therefore no condemnation to them that are in uh, Christ Jesus, comma, who walk not after the flesh. Now, I'm not saying that you lose your salvation, but if you're at a worldly distance from Christ, there is condemnation. There is problems. Are you going to hell? 
I don't know uh, if you're if you're truly saved, you won't. But you're, if you're walking far from the Lord, there is condemnation. In other words, there's problems on the horizons. There are difficulties that will come up. It doesn't apply to you. It doesn't apply to you. In other words, you do have something to fear. To be cast into hell? I think not. But listen, this life here can be most miserable. It can be that peace withdrawn from you uh, that we all want. The rest of the verse says, uh, but at, who, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, that spirit is a capital S spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. The, the best way that Paul says you can find peace, do what the Holy Ghost tells you to do. Yeah. That, that, that is critical and that is, that is a must. If we really want peace, we can't rebel against God and we cannot rebel against the Holy Spirit. If we do either one of those, we're not going to be in a peaceful situation. We're going to be in a torment. We're going to be in a difficulty and uh, no one enjoys that. Verse 2 but the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, in verse 2, he gives them a reminder that they are not under the law. They are no longer the do's and the don'ts. But if you're in Christ Jesus, he is the one that you should follow. No longer interested in the law, but if Christ tells you to do something through the Holy Ghost, it should be your desire to be obedient to that. Now, I don't know about you, but especially when I was a younger kid, if I didn't do as Mama said, there were repercussions, right? He, he, he identifies himself as our Heavenly Father. And if there is a problem... He works it out. He is, the, he is the one that is over us. You know, we live in a day and age, what I found today, that no one, no one likes anybody over them. They want to be in the driving seat, right? And that's what he reminds, he reminds them of. Now, in verse 3, for what the law could not do, now, there was a whole, whole lot the law could not do. The law could not save you. Right. What does the Bible say in of itself concerning the law? It says it's your schoolmaster. Mm -hmm. it, it describes and defines sin. It lets you know what sin is. It lets you know how you have erred from God. It lets us know how far we are from Him and how hopeless we are without the person of Christ. That's the, that is the job of the law, to teach us, to be a schoolmaster, to be a school teacher, to show us our inadequacies when it comes to God. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Now, if you mark in your Bible and you don't get anything else out of this this morning, your flesh is very, very, very weak. You do not, have, you know, that's why I really don't understand these people, and Brother Junior brought that up a little bit, trying to hold out faithful and hang on to Jesus. Listen, you don't have Jesus, he has you. <laughs> <laughs> that's the difference. And, and that, that's why there's security in the person of Christ. And so he, he points out the law could not do it. The law has never been able to do it. In what the law could not do, in that it was weak in the flesh, God sending his own son, and I have this underlined in my Bible, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason that that is integral he looked like a man, walked like a man, exposed to sin like a man, but yet is still the very God of all heaven in flesh. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. That is who he is, the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, why that had to be, the sacrifice had to look like what he was being sacrificed for. 
the very sinless uh, Son of God in the image of the very sinful man, poured out his self for us and became our atonement that we may approach the Father. Now notice this. Condemned sin in the flesh. In other words, he fulfilled the law. He set sin aside in his very own flesh. Verse 4, that the righteousness of, righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. And then again, Baptists don't like this. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, you know, we really want to grab hold and uh, believe me, I've experienced grace and I, I know what experiential salvation is about. But if we begin to use it as a ticket to sin, you don't understand it. If you think that it's just, okay, I can live like a dog now, you've not experienced grace. And I can say that of a surety from the Word of God. Because people who are saved, they crave God's goodness. They crave to be close to Him. And we see this whole text, really the emphasis of this whole text, you can't be far from Him uh, you can't be close to him and have that much sin in your life. Can't, and, and that's why he's saying it, it separates us. Separates us unto hell? No. Separates us from fellowship. Verse 5. For they that are uh, after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Now, so he begins to give us some, some qualifiers, some descriptors of these individuals that are having spiritual problems. They're very mindful of the flesh. They want to look like the world, act like the world. They want to catch the other's eye. They want, uh, if they have a three-bedroom brick, next time they want a four-bedroom brick. If the woman down the street gets new carpet, she wants new carpet. If the guy down the road gets a John Deere, we want one too. This flesh is not sustainable. You will never, ever satisfy this filthy flesh. It's an impossibility. If you don't believe that, uh, review the story of the rich man this week. This will I do. I will tear down my barns and I will build greater. See, there, there's no ending to what this flesh wants. And so, uh, as Paul is writing to the church at Rome, he, he reminds them, listen, <laughs> you need to be led by the Spirit. So how are you, how, how, how is that accomplished? Uh, how do you do that? What, what does that even mean, being led by the Spirit? Now, in the King James Bible, that will be capitalized meaning the Holy Spirit, first of all, we can say that it's not your spirit. It is not what you think. You know, the, the, new, the new day and age saying, just follow your own heart. You know what that will do? That will lead you straight into the pits of hell, following your own heart. So first of all, we have to de 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 delineate between our heart, our spirit, and the spirit of the Almighty. Now, as cruel and hard as this sounds, let me say this, nine times out of ten, they're going to be contrary the one to the other. You're going to want to go left, and the Holy Ghost is going to say, you need to go right. It, it, we're very, very rarely in unison into what the Word of God says. Now, what I have found, uh, as the years fly by, it's a little bit easier to discern, but it isn't any easier to comply with. And, and so he says, for, at, for they are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So, uh, and another thing, and we'll move on, the Holy Ghost and this book will never, ever be at opposites. They will always be in unison. Always. I've told my church this many times, a little Pentecostal woman preacher, told me one time, well, if the Spirit says uh, one thing and the, and the Bible says anything, another thing, I'm going with the Spirit. Well, dear friend, they'll never, ever be contrary. They'll always be in unison. You, you know how I know that? Remember the church, the Gentile churches in the Acts? It said that they did the things in the Word of God 
in the law of God and had never even read the law of God. That's what the Spirit does. That They were following the Holy Ghost, the only thing that they knew, and it led them in unison with what the law taught. And, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, uh, when, you, when you desire to be led of the Holy Ghost, remember, it has to be coincide with this. Verse 6, he makes it very plain, for to be carnally minded is death. Now, a genuine believer that li lives in sin, I can most assuredly tell you I know where that road leads. And it will lead to death. It will lead to the end. And so I want you to see, who is he writing to? The church at Rome, right? What is a church made up of? Saved believers, right? So who's he writing to? Saved folks, right? That means I can be carnally minded. That means you can be carnally minded. That means that we as born again believers have not put that aside. And so we certainly can be led in the wrong direction. And he says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded, if you really want uh, peace in this life, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, if you want peace when the earth is falling apart, go with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want peace when seemingly nothing is left that's sane anymore, go with the Word of God. That's where peace is found. And you know what? People will think you're stupid for it. People will think you're crazy. But you go, you know what? I'm not worried about other people's <laughs> opinion of me. And uh, the older I get, the less I care. So I'm going to look what the Bible teaches me. And they're going to look, teaching your kids at home, what about their social skills? You know what? I don't care. Uh, I literally do not care. Uh, I think mine have better uh, social skills than they do anyway, but I truly don't care because you know what the Bible says? In, in, in the book of Proverbs, it says, train your children up in the way that they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. It didn't give that job to Stewart County Public Schools and give it to me. Train up your children. And, and so we see then that... What ought to be the enticement and the desire of God's people is peace in this present evil world. Now, God always has a plan for us. For women, for men, for born-again believers, He always has a plan, and it ought to be our desire to be a fulfillment of that plan. There's nothing abstract. There's nothing by accident. There's nothing just casting aside. It's all delivered and authored by God. Now, go with me way back to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings 17. And we're going to begin reading in the first verse. Uh, Elisha, the Tishbite, one of the most obedient man that you'll find in the Bible, although he did get off the road. Uh, that shows if it can happen to Elisha, it can happen to you. Uh, uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, in the first verse, the Bible said, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Abel, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now, I want you to see that, that God calls Elisha and says, I want you to go up to uh, I want you to go up to the king's house and say, Hey, now I'm in control of the rain. And unless I say so, it ain't even going to be a dew cast on the ground. That's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? No. Uh, you think you can control the dew? 
Do you think, do you, think you can control the uh, water, the rain? If God tells you you can, you can. Now, while God did this to demonstrate His power, especially His power in God's man, but if we had an experience, experience like that, would you have the confidence in God to believe it? See, not only did he give Elijah what would seem a, uh, an impossible task, I'm going to let you control the rain. Now I want you to go <laughs> go take it in the king's face and shove it at him. You get those things done for me. A lot easier to set at home, ain't it? But a lot easier just to take it easy. But see, that wasn't God's plan. That he had enough confidence in his God that if that's what God said, hey, it ain't going to rain. And in fact, I can, uh, I can now control the rain. And so we see that Elijah is given this difficult direction, verse 2. And the word of the Lord came to him saying, this is after he went and kind of did that in front of the king. He was obedient. And the word of the Lord came unto him saying, get thee hence. Turn thee eastward, hide thyself at, by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan, and it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Now this was the third part of God's plan, was how he would be nurtured in the great drought. And uh, when there'd be no rain for seven years, when people were cutting their babies in half and dividing them to eat, a very, you think you've seen bad, listen, we ain't seen nothing yet. When, when you pay uh, 50 pieces of, uh, of silver for a mule's head, see, we, we think we've had it rough, don't we? we? We all flipped out because it's $5 a dozen for eggs. Listen, you ain't seen nothing yet. And, and, and so we see that this is God's plan for his man's life. You go down to Cherith, it's still running a little bit. You drink out of that, and I'm going to send the ravens to bring you some food. Let's go. Right? I have, I have four of the mouths to feed beside myself. And I'm just being honest, in the flesh, that don't sound like much of a plan to me. When you when you got little girls looking at you hungry, what are you going to do? See, that's where the rubber meets the road. Do we have faith in God? Is he really who he says he is? Or is he not? Oh, Larry, that's the Old Testament. I've heard that so much in 30 years of ministry, I can pick it back up. You know what the Bible says concerning that in Malachi chapter 3? I am the Lord, I change not. Very same God, right? And, and sometimes he does, offer, he does put before us some very difficult things to follow. But you know what? Elijah got down there, and did he worry? Did he, did he wring his hands? Now, uh, I can't think of the name of the group right now. I usually like them. I wish Adam was sitting in his seat because he could tell me. Um, uh, I can't think of it. It's a Southern Gospel group, uh, four, four men. And he, they had this uh, song about Elisha and, uh, and said that he was starting to get stressed and looking around. See, the problem is this, the Bible doesn't say that. Right. The Bible that never says he was looking up to the sky and stressed out. And you know why? Because it didn't happen. He believed God. And he was just waiting on his meal. Uh, you know, he may have even put his napkin on and, got, and, and was getting ready for it. See, when we believe God, there's a peace, the Bible says, a peace that passeth all understanding. And most of the Lord's believers today do not live in that place. We live in a more difficult time, in a more difficult thing, where we beat our own self up. Verse 5, obedience. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. Verse 6, And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. 
Now, that is being in the perfect will of God. And we won't go into that today. It's not the subject. But you know, sometimes our Almighty kind of ups the ante, doesn't he? he? He wants to see, do you really believe him? And we all know what happened to Cherith, don't we? She dried up. And you notice he didn't get he didn't get upset about it. It said that when the brook dried up, God said, get thee, I can't remember the city, I've commanded a widow there to feed thee. And you know what? With pure obedience, he does it again. And that, that is a life of peace. That is a life of happiness. That's a life without stress in the day in which we live. That is the life we should desire before the Lord. Now, if you will, go with me to 1 Kings. Now, unfortunately, 1 Kings this time, uh, chapter 13, just a little further, uh, just a little back. Unfortunately, in the Word of God, we always have the flip side. We have the story of people that don't listen. We have the story of people that ignore the will of God. Uh, 1 Kings 13, beginning in verse 9. 1 Kings 13, uh, 13, beginning in verse 9. We'll begin in verse 8 to get the full thought. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in and eat with thee. Now, if you remember the story, a young prophet, young people, you're vulnerable. You're at a difficult age. You're at an age of influence. Be cautious. Be careful. It says a young prophet was told to give uh, the king a message that was not good, a message that wasn't ple uh, pleasant. You know what? Uh, I, I do love to hear it spiritually, but I love to hear it fleshly too. When, when it's all finding, falling out around me, God's still on the throne. And you know what? He is. But what about, it, what about those messages that are not so much carpool messages? Come out from among them and be you separate, thus saith the Lord. I've, not, I've preached a lot of those messages and I've not had a cartwheel yet. You see what I'm saying? And so this prophet, this preacher, his message wasn't for a cartwheel. It said judgment's coming to this place. Judgment is coming to this city. That was his message. He was to go in. He was to tell the king God's declaration, and he was to keep going. He had specific instruction not to turn around and not to eat of their filthy food in that place. That was his two instructions. You give the message, you don't turn around, and, and don't eat of their junk. That was, the, that was his direction for this mission trip. Now, let's be honest, I see some strange things in that, don't you? If I'm just thinking about it in the flesh, wouldn't it be closer? Now I have to, I have to literally walk across the whole country. Wouldn't it be easier just to turn around and come back out? That's man's thinking, right? I'm going to get hungry. I'm literally going to walk across a whole country. And I'm going to get hungry there. Why can't I have something to eat? Young people, you do not need this world's diet. I can assure you of that. And he did not need what they had to offer. And so in, in verse 9 again, uh, and the rest of verse 8, and the, man of, and the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not eat in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. Now, now think about it. This is his first sermon to the man that he came, that he came to bid to. And he was right down the line. I, I like when I go to churches, man, it's just right down the line the whole time I'm there. You know, uh, I tell you, the, the preachers, you better, I, you better watch the closest that preaches one thing here and preaches another thing in Texas. Uh, look for consistency. 
And so this boy uh, preaches and said, I don't want your filthy food, king. I'm out of here. I just want you to know that your days are wound up. Uh, your time here is done. And now I'm going to keep going. Verse 9. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. And he went another way, obedient to God, and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Now, there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. Now, from the time I, I can even remember, it was two things that I had to do. Respect adults. And if a woman came in and, there, and all the chairs was taken, I was to stand up and give the lady my chair. Uh, I, I, I remember, I don't, I mean, one of my earliest memories, and I've always done that. But you know, this is the sad truth. Not every elderly person has your best interest at heart. Just because they're old and gray doesn't mean they have a spiritual interest in your life. You know, and things like that, we're to evaluate it by the Word of God, are we not? Not, not, not by uh, years of endearment, but thus saith the Lord. That, that is what we are to look at this at. Now there dwelt, verse 11, an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him the works of the man of God, the works of that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king, and they told also to their father. Now, the first thing was he was accurate in his sermon and faithful to the Lord God, and the results happened. The kingdom started falling apart. And we find these people, they're supposed to be people of God. Were they excited? No, I'm going to go home to Betty. This makes me mad. You think right now, if, if President Biden left the White House, would we really give our God the credit that's due his name? And if we did, how many churches would be rejoicing with us? You see what I'm saying? It's okay. In, in theory, it all sounds good. But see, and in this boy's life, it came down re to reality, and the old man was not excited. He was not glad at all. So when we look at age, don't just look at the age. Compare the, the old man's words with what this Bible teaches and go with the Bible. Verse 12, And their father said uh, unto them, what way went he? Now that's very, have it underlined in my Bible. What way did he go? He went in the direction to follow God. And he, he, he was to go forward. And we talked about that just, was it Wednesday night or last week about how there's no, a breastplate but no back plate. That's why he wasn't supposed to turn around. And this old man, so jealous, so enraged, wanted to take him down. What way went he? How can I find him? Where, where will I follow him to? What, what, can I, what can I do to overtake him? For his, for his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said to his son, saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he, and he rode their own. And he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. Now, I will say this on the man's behalf, the young man's behalf. He's already messed up. There was no point of rest. Anywhere in that in God's plan for his life was it to say stop and rest. None whatsoever. What would have happened maybe if he hadn't erred from God's plan? Maybe the old man would have never called him to start with. Don't stop until the Lord tells you to stop. And 
from reading the Word of God, I've never, I've never seen him give that advice to anybody. We're to be a forward people. For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, and they came, uh, verse 14, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak, and he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. And he, and he said unto him, Come home with me, eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in, in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. He, told, he repeated God's plan for his life. You know what? When you're, when you're at your most discouraged point, repeat to yourself God's plan for your life. There's no getting off place. Uh, there, there's no stopping point. So that's exactly what this young man does. Verse 17, he says, For it was said to me by the word of the Lord that thou shalt not, uh, thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. He said unto me, I am a prophet also as thou art. Now, people will tell you anything. People will say anything. That doesn't mean they're for you. I'm a preacher just like you're a preacher. Y'all remember this? And, and, and if I saw how, e how ridiculously evil it was when I was a kid, I would never have done it. But I, again, a young man can be easily swayed. And I was maybe 11 or 12, and the free little church over at home had an American flag and a Christian flag up by the pulpit. You ever reviewed the pledge to that thing? I have, and it's full of, it's full of uh, compromise. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior whose kingdom it stands. One brotherhood uniting all Christians in service and in love. Man, let's group hug. The problem is, you take a right down here at the end of this street and two, and two lots down. There's a Church of Christ. They call themselves Christian. Do you want to unite with them? They deny that they deny the sufficiency of Christ. I don't want anything to do with them. You have to be the baptized and you have to keep it. Then what's the purpose of Christ? Right? See, there's false prophets out there that do not have our best interest in mind. And, and we as the Lord's people need. And, and, and so this guy that comes and says, hey man, I'm a preacher just like you. He spoke to me. Come back. And uh, he says, okay, for you to come back, go to my house, we'll have a meal together, and everything will be hunky-dory. And unfortunately, the young boy listened to him. He went back. He sat down with the old man. He had a meal. Got a good drink of cold water. Took off on his trip again, and a tiger got him. See, don't err from the Word of God. Don't err from, from God's plan for your life. So he went from being a victor in front of a king to a piece of tiger meat in just a few hours. See, we need to follow God's plan for our lives, do we not? And don't let anybody, don't let anyone interfere with that plan. We need to be faithful to God's plan for our life. He went from what was, now, I, I've not ever seen a tiger except on, in a zoo, and I was on the right side of the cage, and he was inside. But, you know, uh, didn't say anything about a tiger as he was going along there, did it? Mine didn't say that there was anything that was going to attack him because he was safely and sufficiently in the perfect will of God. And as soon as he got out of it, boom. Now, last thing, I would say that we spend the majority of time not in the perfect will of God, but what is in the permissive will of God. Now, blessed be the name of grace 
He just don't take us out like he did that young prophet. Boom. But you'll live, you'll live a life without peace. You, you'll, li- you'll live a life where you dread getting up the next day. You ever had a job you hated so bad that, <laughs> that you did not want to get up and go in the next day? But you had five people you had to feed, so you had to do it anyway? That's a miserable life, is it not? I, I, I've, lived, I, I've lived that life. But you know what? There's peace in that when there's Christ. There's peace when you are in the will of God that that job you may not think is too much because you know you're in the will of God. You get up, you go, and there may be someone to witness to. There may be someone to tell the goodness of God. And you know what? You don't get a check no more, but you'll get an an automated deposit to feed your family with, right? So that is, that is critically important. You want happiness? I, I, I think that is natural, a, a natural desire of most people, don't you? To want peace. To desire peace inside. That, does that mean it's gonna be no bumps in the road? No, I, 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 you'll probably have more bumps than the average but you have peace with the bumps. That's what we need. You won't find that halfway serving the Lord. You will not find it. You'll be in, and when he gives you a difficult ca- task, and, and notice both our instances, they had to go in before the king. You will to go tell Biden how much you love him? Go in before the king. See, he's going to ask things sometimes way up here of our ability. Lord, I can't do it. If he asks you, he'll grant you the grace to do it. I have found that to be true. I, I, I know that to be a certainty is that he's never asked me one thing that he didn't give me grace to do. That's the God we serve. 